Hi, I'm Melanie McFarland, and welcome to this episode of Salon Talks. I am so excited today to be talking with Jeff Hiller, who is co-starring in the fabulous HBO series, Somebody Somewhere, which is coming into its season two on April 23rd. I am looking forward to it. I hope you are too. Jeff, welcome, and thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Melanie. It's nice to be here. (laughs) (laughs) Nice to have you. So I'm sure you've heard this a million times, but every time that I talk to somebody about somebody somewhere, (laughs) all at once. Yes, all at once. <laughs> that must be fun this season. Yeah, you're in somebody somewhere all at once. How's, how's Michelle? Um, but, you know, I think part of the reason that when people discovered this series, and it really was a discovery, right. it was coming at us at this time, you know, it was such a comfort because we were coming kind of out of, we saw, we were seeing the light of the, at the tunnel at the end of the pandemic. And here's this beautiful show where it's sunny and outside and, but also, you know, in Kansas, which is one of those, you know, places that generally people don't see depicted realistically on television, right? right? Um, The second season still continues that, but how do you think that this season may hit people just in terms of now we are all collectively in a different place. And so are, you know, so are your characters. You have, you know, Sam who, is now finding her voice after um, after grieving. That's Bridget Edwards' character, by the way. And then with Joel, Joel is in a new place this season. So can we talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I think, uh, I don't think, we already shot it. I know the answers. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but Joel is, um, uh, it's been a year since we've last seen them and Joel and Sam are um, super tight, super, super tight maybe almost so tight uh, to the exclusion of others, uh, which is maybe not necessarily always super healthy. And um, and I think that uh, Joel is ready to sort of look around and see if, um, if he can start getting some of those other things on his uh, dream board and, um, and uh, keep growing, keep growing. Cause that's what's great about Joel is that he's not afraid to, um, to say, I think you need this. I think I need this. Um, and I love that about him. And I, I want him to continue to get those vision board things. <laughs> yeah, let's talk about the vision board because that is such a huge part of his personality. Is there anything that's changed that people, not even as an Easter egg, but you know, are there things in the vision board that you think they've changed for this season? Well, I think that um, maybe not the, the the macro, but the micro. I think that that um, <laughs> I think he still uh, wants the general things that he wanted before, but now the specifics are are aimed in a different way because life has led him in a different way, which I think is, you know, I think we can all identify with that. <laughs> um, when you when you ask when you look around, and you're like, oh, this is this is life after forty, yeah. Um, <laughs> and, and so I think that he's he's really honing in and 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 realizing exactly what it is that he wants and and what he wants to go and and get. Mm-hmm. Now, I'm going to back up a little bit because I jumped right in, assuming that everybody knows everything about your character. So, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So just as a bit of background, we have um, Bridget Everett plays Sam, and we spoke with her last year about the show. And Sam, um, this is a year after she's kind of returned home in her grief. She's grieving her sister, and she connects again with Joel um, and develops this beautiful friendship first as co-workers, and then they join each other in choir practice, which is... Not at all what you would think it would be. Um, and I'm just going to leave that to people to discover. I've got to <laughs> say, <HBO> Max. <laughs> yeah, just go on HBO Max. But one thing that um, that I love about this season, as well as the last, is it continues this idea of music being the emotional core of mm. the series. But it brings it down, with a few exceptions, to really the individual's, the individual character's relationship with music. So for mm-hmm. instance, with Sam a lot of it is that she's finding her voice, even though she has fabulous pipes, but really finding her voice. For Joel, she has, Joel has this connection to a very specific song um, that's a touchstone. And so I don't think it's really giving anything away since he mentioned it, but tell us about Laura Brannigan's Gloria and what that means to Joel. And did it mean anything to you? Well, this is one of those things, you know, you hear stories about people writing toward the actor. <laughs> and this is one of those, this is a song that means a lot to me. Uh, I wrote, I ha- no, I wrote, I wrote the song Gloria. Uh, <laughs> just delusional. 
I put it on a playlist. <laughs> That's my creative element. Um, I, I created this playlist called Yes Girl. And during season one, I was driving Bridget and, and Murray Hill, who plays Fred Rococo around, uh, probably going to either Target or or brunch because those our options were limited during the pandemic. <laughs> and uh, that song came on and we all were just, we wanted to sing. It was just so beautiful. I wanted to, and if you listen to the words, they, I mean, the teaser has already been released where you, where you hear uh, Joel saying that he wants this song at his wedding. It, it's not a song for a wedding, but it's a song that has so much joy and so much release um, that even with the words, that don't mean anything about <laughs> a, a union between two people. The joy is still there. And, and you know, Laura Brennigan has pipes. So does Bridget Emmerich. And so it does feel, uh, I, I, when we were driving around in season one and that song was playing and she was singing along, I was like, I can't believe I'm driving with Bridget Everett and she's singing this song with me. Because I've kind of been worshiping her for, a little over a decade <laughs> in New York City's downtown theater community. <laughs> yeah, and that was, you know, between that and the duet on Peter Gabriel, oh. the first season, which was just one of those moments where it just hooked right into the heart. It was just amazing. <laughs> um, there's a lot of, I mean, there's there are really these wonderful cues that people recognize and connect through music. So can you kind of talk about um, from your perspective, what is it about the connection of music in the show to its, you know, its emotional story? I think that Bridget, she talks about it as um, like a, a, another character. You know how like they say, New York is the fifth woman in Sex and the City. You know, it's <laughs> music is the is the the third <laughs> friend in Manhattan, Kansas. And right. uh well, the thing is that the, the show has this sort of mandate for authenticity. They really want it to be, seem natural and seem real. So it's not like, which is not to say that I don't love like in Chicago when like, you know, Renee Zellweger is all of a sudden in this beautiful light wearing gorgeous costumes. I love that stuff. But this is really played for how music, um, how music moves you in real life. And it is singing a dirty song in, in your car while you're driving around or, um, or just a song comes on the radio and you love it or or you have silly little chants while you're making a drink <laughs> oh yeah can and, you can you share that or is that a surprise best left for that moment oh i don't know i i think uh, everyone can know about it. the song teeny teeny <laughs> it's not a big teeny it's a little teeny a teeny teeny <laughs> it's a martini but it's yeah. a tiny <laughs> yeah you all did you all make that up i mean honestly, bridget, that is a, a, a hard, hardcore 100 percent bridget everett original <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's some of the fun about this is that you get to see these moments that one suspects are either callbacks to the cabaret or um or improvised in addition to the scripted moments right. um what kind of freedom that do you do have to kind of insert your personality and those improvisations into Joel? They, they, they give you uh, the, the showrunners, Hannah Boss and, and Paul Thorine, uh, give us a lot of, of leeway. Uh, you know, we're not changing the actual meaning of the script, but we're um, massaging the words to make them feel natural, to make them feel like they, they're coming from our mouths. And, um, and it's not like, you know, you're not trying to like Judd Apatow where you're like, let me see this outrageous thing that's, you know, super hilarious because you're you're wanting to con continue that realness and that um, authenticity. Um, but it is about making it feel natural. I think that's the big thing. It, it's not about making it feel outlandish. It's a, it's about making it feel natural. And I mean, I, I come from the improv world. Um, so I think we normally think of it as being, you know, Jane Lynch being so hilarious talking about, you know, all the guys she had sex with in that show or whatever. <laughs> Thinking of the 40 year old virgin, I don't know why I'm going there, but I am. <laughs> um, but this is not that kind of improv. This is more like making it real, making it natural. Mm -hmm. So let's back this up a little bit. Um, and I know that people have spoken to you about this, but I since it comes up again this season in a really fundamental way, you studied theology as well as theater. 
I did, right? yeah. And Texas Lutheran. And, and and those things, if you, and I grew up in a very religious household, right? And I understand how those things go together, just in terms sure. of, you know, they they really, there is kind of a, a little bit of a spectacle in presenting the liturgy, right? 100%. So when jo this came to you, when Joel came to you, how much of that, I mean, obviously you've gone through years of improv, you've done so many different roles. How, how did those elements, or let's put it this way, did those elements of what you initially studied kind of come back to the fore after all these other roles that you had, which of course are very different from Joel? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah I mean, but before Joel, I, I played a lot of mean waiters and flight attendants that, you know, took away your bag. Um, and naked guy, I do remember you as naked guy. Yes, yes. They put that picture in my college magazine. Can you imagine? Um, uh, yes, I played I played a naked ghost in Ghost Town. <laughs> Good memory. Um, yeah, I I think that uh, um, when I read the script, I think you know how sometimes I, I took this acting class and it was like, when you're going to get a serious regular role, it's really going to be a role that is of your essence. And I thought, well, crap, nobody writes roles that are my essence. <laughs> I'll never get a TV show. And when I read this, I thought, oh my God, this is of my essence. So much so that I kind of thought, oh, maybe they wrote this for me. But then since then, like, Every gay man over 40 is like, yeah, I auditioned for that part too. <laughs> well, what, what did you think? I mean, so let's let's really drill down on that. What would you say if you were to say out loud and put it to words, what's your essence that you believe that Joel captures? I mean, he's an optimist. He's um, in love with music. He believes in chosen family. He... Um, he worships Bridget Everett, um, and 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 I, I, I that sounds a little flippant, but and I I mean I don't worship Bridget Everett, but I think there is a certain uh, type of person who who can see someone who is out there and a star, and and say I know that person is a star, and nobody else does, but for some reason I know it, and I can't wait till you all catch up, um, and I think. I think Joel and I both feel that way about Bridget and Sam. <laughs> and uh, I think the fact that he is a part of a faith community, you never see that. If you ever see, if you ever see gay plus church, it means church is hurting gay. <laughs> you never see them working together. And I know dozens of, I grew up in Texas, so that's where they mostly are, of, of queer folks who are members of faith communities. And that is where they find their, their social outlet, their spiritual outlet, their, um, their friends, their chosen family. And I love that this show made the bold choice to <laughs> show this truth that uh, never gets shown ever. Mm -hmm. Not that I've seen at least. Not only that, Joel's, choices that he makes have so much to do with his faith like for the first season saying we can't do choir anymore because it's I don't I feel bad lying to the pastor or you know in this season he really has to wrestle with being asked with Fred to officiate right, right. to be um, to be in this role where he is this representation of something that's divine and but you know and he he doesn't do much wrestling with it because his friend you know explains to it like it's okay <laughs> But that must have been meaningful for you to be able to not only be seen, it's one thing to say like, hey, I'm a, I'm a gay man and I go to church and be part of faith community, but also acting from a position of faith must have been interesting for you to take. Yeah, it, it, it reminded me a lot of, um, of the really cool Christians that I know that are, um, that uh, are not about the dogma and the, the rules and the, uh, you know, judging, but are about this message of social justice and welcoming and um, love and being moral. And it's, it's, uh, it's about what's right, not about um, the rules or what have you. Um, and I, I love that he does that. I love that he's, um, he's got this moral core and this center that is important to him and that he's, he's going to abide by. Mm -hmm. um, 
and then you can watch Succession and go the other way, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to go back to something since you mentioned Succession. This is a, that may be a strange leaping off point, but you mentioned <laughs> something about the fact that this is such a different role and a lot of what you've played is like, you know, people like the mean side character. And when I was looking at this season and all the things you're appearing on your recent titles, so there's this, there's Whiteley, an American horror story, right? right. There's, you know, you have a role in evil, you know, yeah. you have, and then you have, so, you know, and this, this kind of, so what is it like for you to be in all these, you know, be known for all these roles or like you are, people are like, oh yeah, you're very memorable, partly because you're very, like there's this outsized meanness. And oh then yeah. We have, and then we have- I thought you were going to say weird looking. You know, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or or Wiley, who's like on another level, right? But, right, right. but yeah, more than me. And, yeah, but also you as Jeff, what is it like for you to come out of like doing all these roles that you do very well and are memorable for, oh. and then and then play Joel? Um, you know, Joel, I, I I know that I'll never have another role that's as good as this, and I I feel um so grateful that I get to play it that people are watching it enough that we can have a second season. And that, I mean, I know this sounds a little lofty. You're like, all right, it's seven episodes on HBO, calm down. But that we, <laughs> that, that I am putting out this character who is a member of the LGBTQI plus community, but also a human and three dimensional and um, and not, you know, right now it's not a good time to be a queer person in the United States. Um, and uh, there's all the, this distraction and laws saying queer people are going to take your kids and turn them into goblins. And I'm just really happy to be playing a character who is openly queer and also uh, a human normal good person um i mean i'll play a serial killer again too but my point is <laughs> i love i love joel and i love that joel is not a saint but he's also not a stereotype he's a he's a, a, a full person mm -hmm. so i'm glad that you mentioned that because this is something that i wanted to be sure to ask you about there is a left raft of leg legislation legislation going on at the state level that is very, you know, anti-drag, um, um, anti-trans, anti-queer in state legislations or or state, you know, state governments throughout the country, um, including in Kansas. Yeah. And um I wonder, no, you know, of course, what happens this season. Mm -hmm. Here's a show where we have Joel, you know, really digging into a relationship with his best friend, but also, you know, Joel finds love in the first season, you know, Joel is meeting people and, you know, he is, you know, you get to see him kind of make these very tender and gentle connections, you know, throughout the season. And then not only that, you know, the season revolves around a marriage involving Fred Rococo, who's found love. Um, and it's all about preparing for his wedding. Um, mm -hmm. and Fred specifically says like, look, I, you know, he went and spoke to her parents, you know, um, she, she said like, look, I'm in love with the trans man. This is who I love. Um, what must it been like to kind of be in those moments and filming them and knowing that it would come out and obviously not knowing that it would come out right as these things are going through state houses, these, you know, these, uh, bills, but, you know, being in this moment and making this season. I mean, I don't think that we approached it as a, a political act, mm -hmm. but right now the personal is political, especially the personal of these personals. <laughs> um, and so it is revolutionary. It is political. It is an act of protest just by showing a trans person a queer person who are people <laughs> and uh i think that that is sort of revolutionary and i think that that is uh, um i mean it comes from a a character place a story place that this this makes sense 
that is what these characters would do. That is how these characters would live. Um, and unfortunately, we live in a time when that that is that is political. Uh, but I think it's important too to to put that out there to show uh, queer people who are um, whole and uh, and you know not not heroes, not saints, but uh, not not evil monsters either. <laughs> And finding respite and connection and community too. I think that's one thing that people, especially right now, that's like the next thing of like, not only are we coming out of the pandemic, we have to learn how to reconnect with each other. And I feel Ooh. like this season really explores that. I love that. And I, I think that everyone, be you queer or uh, or or too old or, or uh, you don't fit in uh, for any, Everybody feels like they're the outsider. Um, that's a little secret that I'm just now discovering. <laughs> and so it's so nice to see these folks who feel like outsiders finding each other and finding community. Uh -huh. It fills my heart with joy. It's like a weighted blanket. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to end, but I feel like that's the perfect place to end. Really. <laughs> really is. The weighted blanket always is the place to go. It is, because then we're just going to take a nap. <laughs> Thank you so much. And again, season two of Somebody Somewhere comes to HBO on Sunday, April 23rd. And you can always catch up with the first season on HBO Max. Thank you so much, Jeff. This has been a pleasure. Thank you, Melanie. I loved it.